Ja, varmt välkomna tillbaka efter pausen på denna nätverksträff för immersiva medier som Riksantikvarbetet anordnar här med Kalmar läns museum. Jag heter Adam Norman, programledare och jag har bredvid mig här nu nästa gäst som är William Islesley från Göteborgs universitet. Eh, grund och botten arkeolog har jag lyckats läsa mig till men jobbar nu med forskningsdata på Göteborgs universitet. Ja, det är rätt, ja. Mm. Vad bra. Och du kommer att hålla en presentation här som kommer att röra eh, kanske museernas eh, digitalisering i stort och en del olika perspektiv på det. Så eh, jag kommer helt enkelt lämna över till dig. Tack så Varmt mycket. Välkommen Tack. hit. God morgon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, William Gottlieb Nilsley. Uh, and uh, as Adam said, I work as a research data advisor for the Swedish National Data Service. Um, uh i just wanted to say before we start although i'll take the presentation in english uh you're more than welcome to uh ask questions in swedish um my my swedish is okay uh it's just that my translation skills are not so great uh so just for clarity's sake i'll i'll take the presentation in english um so as as adam said uh my background is in archaeology uh and over the last five years or so as i carried out my phd um i've become more involved in in digital cultural heritage um and, and my phd i i uh, disputed last year uh and that was focusing on a uh, comparison between uh digital visualizations and digital databases and archives and repositories uh as a means of communicating and representing historic environments um So the, the aim of the presentation today is not so much to talk about uh, 360 degree video. Uh, in fact, I had a bit of a panic when Nina invited me and I was like, I don't know anything about this. Uh, but she, she wanted me to talk about the wider pro uh, the context uh, of, of digital techniques and digital media. So what I'm talking about does not preclude 360 degree digital techniques, uh, but it covers more basis than just that. Um, so, so as I said, my aim is to contextualize immersive media as, as a general concept uh, within the wider assemblage of the museum. Uh, and that's a museum as a network of political actants, whether that's the curators, the content creators, or the visitors themselves. Um, and that also includes the research and the material fabric of the historic environment itself. Um, and I guess the best way to summarize this would be that this is something of a, of a literature review uh, in the sense that it's a compilation of the results of different academic uh, articles, uh, books, uh, theses that, that focus on the, the list of uh, concepts that I have uh, posted up here. Um, and that's whether it's just focusing on a couple of them or a few of them at the same time. And my aim was to give something of a, a holistic overview of what I would consider to be a requirement of an effective immersive media experience um, of, of any given historic environment. And I think that as a starting point, I would like to stress that all of these things on this list are, are choices on, on the creator and the museum's behalf. Uh, and whether that's uh, as, as, a, as a consultant uh, externally or as someone within the museum. And as a choice, I would also like to stress that these are political choices. And by that, I don't mean political in the parliamentary or governmental vein. I mean political in the representative vein. Um, And that is the idea that politics is to present and represent uh, on behalf of a body politic, whether that's a distinct body politic or an indistinct one. Um, so whether it's an aesthetic choice or a historical choice or a technological choice or so on, nothing is simply binary or black and white. These are political choices as well and as such they needed to be treated with great care. Um, 
First of all, I thought it would be important to to clear up what it is that I think a historic environment is. Um, so many organisations have their own definitions of, of what a historic environment is. Uh, this one here is uh, it's given by the National Planning Policy Framework in the UK. Uh, and as such, it's the one that the UK uh, has for its planning and development guidelines, but it's also the one that Historic, Envi uh, historic England use uh, when they talk about historic environments. Um, by comparison, Rig Santikvari and Bittiet, uh have uh, a definition which is the working definition in Sweden. Uh, and by comparison, I would say that it's a little bit better than the, the UK definition uh, because it, it, for those of you that aren't familiar, it encapsulates all of this uh, that's in the uh, English version, uh, but also includes recognition of intangible heritage such as place names and folklore. Um, there are other definitions that go further still. Uh, I think Historic Environment Scotland is particularly good. Um, which is inclusive of things like music and literature and so on, and things that can be connected to the landscape uh, as as a form of heritage. Um, but the idea between for this slide is not so much to to draw attention to the definition, but the purpose of the definition. Um, so when these definitions are used in, in this context, uh, for example, the, the, the National Planning Policy Framework, the idea is that it's, it's to characterize the natural and cultural aspects of the landscape as a means of managing knowledge. Um, its purpose is, is mitigating against the impact of planning and development. It's not how we, as inhabitants of anthropogenic space, experience and realize the historic environment. And uh, what I wanted to do was to just to compare the terms historic environment to, to the concept of heritage. And I'm not sure if Swedes have, uh, have the same phrase here but, or something similar. Uh, but in, in Britain, we have the saying, teaching grandma to suck eggs which means to give someone advice about something that they're already very, very familiar with. Uh, so I'm certain everyone here is, is fairly up to date on what heritage is and the difference between the, the historic environment and heritage. But I thought it was important because how it's used in planning and development sectors doesn't necessarily make those differences. Um, so the, in the UK in particular, uh, the terms historic environment and heritage are often used interchangeably. Um, and they are related, of course, uh, and that's what I'm going to point out on the, on the next slide. Uh, but they aren't synonymous at all. Um, so heritage is, is it's about values. Uh, it's about relationships, and that's relationships between people and other people, uh, people in institutions, people in governments. Uh, people and objects and practices and so on. Uh, it shouldn't just be reduced to objects and practices themselves, or landscapes in this case, uh, that these aren't things of latent value. Uh, it's, it's the relationship to these things that we create daily in the present that characterizes heritage, not the objects themselves. So this is a, a slightly different definition or set of definitions of, of a historic environment. And I think these are definitions that are closer to how we actually experience and live and feel uh, historic environments rather than the, the planning perspective. Um, so the previous definition, I would say, and perhaps you would agree, uh, is, is not particularly far reaching. Um, and it has quite a lot in common with definitions of landscape archaeology or cultural landscapes and the problem with those terms is that they're very limited to archaeology and aren't all landscapes cultural in some way um, but these definitions that I'm showing here they they're sort of built on 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 the intangible in a way uh, the, the propos of both fidelity to the material remnants of the past and 
the abstract and experiential aspects of spatially defined heritage. So in the previous definition that I showed, the landscape itself is a material artifact, which sort of assumes that it has this latent value just waiting for us to stumble upon, um, rather than being a performative space through which human and non-human processes are intertwined and integrated. So to reunite the concept of a historic environment as a landscape with memory, meaning, personal effects, I think a line should be drawn between the historic environment of the planning world and the historic environment that we meet daily. Uh, and this is, this is the historic environment, this latter one, that we are trying to capture and visualize when we, when we, when we, when we take into account uh, digital media techniques. So whether that's augmented reality, virtual reality, 360 degree video, but it's also the most difficult because um, this is a shared space by definition, we all exist within it. But equally, there are as many points of convergence as there are of divergence, and that's contingent upon the individual themselves. And, and of course, as an individual, you then have your own understanding and appreciation of heritage and what values you attach to that. Um, so I, as, as I said, my, my, my thesis I defended last year, and it was specifically ingrained uh, within, within cultural uh, heritage, but also critical heritage studies. And I think one thing that's important to say about critical heritage studies is that, first of all, it's critical in, in the same way that critical thinking is, is critical. It's, it's not just pointing out what's bad. Uh, although sometimes it does come across that way. And to some extent, I think that has to be part of it, um, particularly when it comes to the British Museum. Um, I think in, in many ways, though, I think it's more of a, a label than an in independent field of study. Because um, I'm, I'm certain to many people watching here, I'm certain to people in the room, uh, that this is something of a redundant label. It's probably the normative way of researching, curating, or carrying out heritage uh, for, for many people uh, in this network. Um, uh, but in essence, it, it goes back to that term representation or, or representation in the way that we practice heritage. And that's a heritage inclusive of social and economic capital or gender, ethnic perspectives, um, even the way that we view modernity and, and Western European or Western, uh, well, well, global North trains of thought. Um, but for me, for me, uh, it, it sort of represents a bit of a line in the sand. Um, before I started my PhD, I worked in a historic environment record in, in England and I was all about authorized heritage. If it wasn't in that database, it didn't matter. Um, so when I started that PhD, that kind of, that perspective went out of the window. I mean, I wasn't helpful at all. Um, but I think it's also important to sort of remember as well that it's not just a term that means a kind of gentler heritage. Uh, critical heritage studies can be very divisive. Um, uh, for example, the repatriation of stolen or looted artifacts. Um, and sometimes this creates a discourse that falls on deaf ears. That's, that's you again, British Museum. Um, but sometimes it has successes as well, uh, regardless of the controversies. Uh, so one such example I would say quite recently uh, is the uh, Swedish World Culture Museum's recent uh, bid to the state to allow the return of its collections of Benin bronzes uh, to Nigeria, for example. So I would say that it does represent something different from previous practice, but again, to the same extent, for some people, this is just a label. Um, and that 
sort of brings me round more to the, the digital aspects that uh, I was invited here to talk about. Uh, so I have uh, a set of case studies that I've used either throughout my uh, PhD or in later research projects. Uh, so the one that I've worked on most uh, as part of my PhD thesis was a case study of the uh, Gothenburg City Museum's uh, visualization of Gothenburg in the 17th century. Uh, so this uh, is a is a well, it's not just a, a, a virtual reality uh, experience. It's been deployed in different ways, but principally, it's a collaboration between Yotabori uh, and company, the the Gothenburg Tourist Board, uh, the museum itself, uh, the Visual Arena, and Gothenburg's Stadsbygnads Kontoret. Um, and uh, it's principally a part of the Birth of Gothenburg exhibition, where it's present as a video currently. Uh, it's been deployed uh, as a virtual reality station uh, over at um, the Visual Arena Lindholmen uh, in um, the tourist office in Kungsportsplatzen in Gothenburg. Uh, it was in the museum. Uh, lobby at one point. Uh, it's been shown and displayed at Volvo Ocean Race. It's been shown and displayed at uh, the Gothenburg Culture Colossus. Um, and by and large, it's delivered uh, via uh, an Xbox with an Xbox controller and uh, a, a virtual reality headset. So that's more or less uh, how it's 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 most consistently been displayed. There are differences. There is an augmented reality tour of the city center, uh, but that came a little bit after the virtual reality aspect. Um, and my other case studies are a little bit more recent. Uh, they came from Rieks and Quarry Embittet Forschning or Utbildning funded. Uh, project uh, called uh, Nia Technique Melan Forschning or Publique. Uh, so these uh, focused on the uh, visualization uh, of Hemse Star of Schirke uh, that's on display in the uh, uh, well Swedish History Museum in the Vikingernes Veld exhibit. And uh, the Dimensions in Testimony AI experience, which um, principally will be in the uh, Holocaust uh, Museum. Um, although in this case, this was uh, a kind of uh, evaluative version that we had in, in the History Museum uh, for the sole purpose of, of exploring and researching the, the, the technology itself. Uh, so as you, as you can see on the slide, uh, we, we undertook a series of observations and uh, group interviews and one-to-one -one interviews in order to, to evaluate uh, these, these two very different um, digital experiences. Uh, and the principal uh, issues the project uh, aimed to address uh, was, was kind of the, the uncritical and uh, mimetically driven usage of immersive and interactive technology, uh, as well as the need for uh, cultural heritage actors, both as creators uh, of, of digital content uh, and as, as museum workers to, to work more systematically uh, with source criticism uh, and, and the evidence that goes into to these um, uh, experiences. Um, and that's alongside the different mediations uh, based on, on the experiences themselves, but also involving uh, empathy and presence. Um, so, so effect and the sensory aspects of history were, were a large part of this project. And we started from the principle that the gap between research and audience is unreasonably large. Uh, and, and, the, and research in a general sense um, has, has not really benefited from, from the advances that we've made in technology and research communication. So 
these are, are, are the main concepts that I feel from the, the, the wealth of literature that we have on, on, on digital and immersive media that really contribute to a holistic um, experience. And, and this is the, the kind of network and assemblage of things that really need to be present to, to contribute to a, a, a meaningful and authentic, uh, well, I suppose that's cheating to say authentic because it's one of those, but uh, an authentic experience of, of, of a historic environment. Um, so Stuart Dunn uses the analogy of Plato's cave to argue that it's digital spatial media that conditions the identities of nations, regions, uh, communities, and the individuals in space that, uh, that have never seen, uh, or that we have never seen, uh, and we can never see. Um, and it's, it's, it's digital media, as we, as we conceive of it today, that, that conditions this. Um, but if this is to be the case, then I am a firm belief that these concepts must be present in some way. Um, so uh, to go through them, I guess, kind of one by one, um, trustworthiness and authenticity are not the same thing. Uh, trust can be created without any source critique or research really at all. Um, and in fact, some of the responses to our interviews in the uh, Nia Technique Melon Forschning or Public were really eye-opening uh, when it came to that. There was quite a few people around the interviews with with hemp uh, uh, around interviews about hempsa and dimensions in testimony that suggested that those experiences were believable simply for being part of the museum, and I think that's a problem. Um, and I think it's also a position uh, that the museum finds itself in that demands great responsibility. And that's especially the case when uh, museums are very often part of the historic fabric of the city itself. Um, so yesterday we heard from um, the, the digital contributions to Vrock, which I think has a little bit of an advantage in a way from being a completely new museum. Now that's not to say that it didn't take a lot of work and research to go into that, but it allowed them to build digitality into the core of what they do. Whereas other museums have to adapt to that later on. And that depends on space, financing, research, and so on. But there are museums where, uh, in some cases, as part of the historic fabric of the city, so Gothenburg City Museum, for example, which is in the old headquarters of the East India Company, um, that arguably represents part of an oppressive heritage um, that the museum has to kind of balance in a way uh, in how, how it represents and presents uh, it, it, its exhibitions. And they do a lot of good work to kind of make that balance. Uh, but in some ways, it still leverages a, a, a trustworthiness and believability simply from being so established within the city. Um, whereas authenticity, on the other hand, um, I would say from my own research, uh, relates to something that uh, Bruno Latour would call aura. And to some extent, that can be recreated, I would say. Uh, and that could be recreated through the technological quality of the mediation. And this isn't necessarily tied to digitality. Um, it applies to physical reconstructions as well. Uh, and Latour himself uses the example of uh, a Veronese painting, uh, Nozze de Carna. Uh, and the original is placed in the Louvre, but there is a facsimile that's been mediated digitally and 3D printed to recreate the brush strokes and the different layers of paint uh, and the materials used in the original that resides in a Palladio on San Giorgio in Venice. 
And it's the placement and the impact uh, of the facsimile that's felt as if it's the original rather than the, the original itself in the Louvre, even though it's never been touched by Veronese's hands. And thus, it's important to remember that authenticity then has a trajectory uh, of where and how it is felt, uh, which can, I would argue, be created digitally. Um, but it depends on this assemblage of actors, uh, including the original itself, and the original creator, that we need to kind of mediate and translate some way digitally. Um, and it creates something more than the sum of its parts. And I think that sort of speaks to what authenticity is. It's something more than the sum of the whole. Uh, oh, sorry. And the, there, are, there are, of course, some forms of authenticity that we can't recreate. And I don't think that we should. Uh, for example, individual or bodily authenticity. Now, imagine that you were to be, uh, and I'll use the case to do of Gothenburg, in fact, uh, a visitor to a 17th century city. Um, now, in, in Sweden at the time, uh, there were very few places that it was legal to reside and be Jewish, for example. Does that mean that we have to limit our experiences of contemporary digital spaces to people who are non-Jewish? And no, is of course the answer. But there are things that would make things authentic that we really shouldn't ought to achieve. Um, empathy and presence, again, is very closely linked to immersivity. Um, and immersivity and effect depends upon the technological mediation of perceived realism, whether it's in the same way that authenticity does or not. Um, and that can be in terms of plausibility, uh, emotional realism, or perceptual quality. Um, and the key aspect to this is the psychological experience of presence, i.e. being there, not just gazing upon <clears throat> the relics of the past, but, but being in it. And I would say that in many ways, perceiving presence uh, seamlessly through immersive media is, is, is not currently achievable. Um, but it's these factors that are, are frequently cited by, by a great many literature uh, that uh, are, are described as desirable, uh, as opposed to absolute photorealism and, and technical quality. Uh, transparency and source critique uh, are also crucial in many ways for authenticity, but also as a means of building trust. Uh, as my colleagues uh, Gunnar Almavik and Jonathan Westin have argued, there is a, a, often a conflict between the desire to create a well-researched space and the desire to place realistic, uh, to create a place realistic in its composition and appearance. And therefore, uh, there's a need for dissimulation as much as there is of simulation. Uh, blurring. Uh, so one good example, actually, I think, was in the in the memories of Mexico, where the characters were highlighted in, in a, a very thick white line that made it clear that they weren't part of the visualization in the same way as the rest of the background. And I think it's that dissimulation uh, that's important to to sort of bring us back from the immersive experience in a way that reminds us that these are translations, interpretations. Um, and, and the same with the uh, Victoria Fortet as well, with the um, with the with the, the the artist depictions of the the soldiers within the fort itself. And I think it's important because blurring the lines between completeness and incompleteness is more of a means of avoiding the question of uncertainty than it is a means of being an effective form of communication with the goal of bringing the audience closer to the experience. Um, knowledge transfer, pedagogy and agency 
are the things that determine what we actually gain from an experience. Uh, and this isn't limited to, to digitality either. Um, for example, uh, there's an Australian Chinese artist, Sean Tan, who uh, has numerous uh, award-winning graphic novels where there are no words at all. Uh, so for example, uh, the arrival uh, documents the experience of migration, uh, which is an experience that quite a few citizens in Sweden can relate to. Um, and in relation to digitality, simply giving everyone the possibility to roam and explore, it doesn't really mean anything without giving them the context and the ability to read without the words. Um, as, as an ecosystem uh, and as, a, as an assemblage, it's dependent on the agency of both the human visitors and creators and the non-human elements that are within the, the visualization. Um, and that represents not only the object, uh, but the, de the, the deployment uh, and the technology itself. Um, so over imbuing agency to photorealistic models, instead of placing the interpretive emphasis on the viewer, I would say should be discouraged. Um, the, the aim is not to create um, uh, 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 a, a facade uh, through the graphic, um, which by itself can lead to presentation of hypothesis as fact, or at worst, with spectacularly insufficient communication, uh, present a, a source of misinformation, misinformation that could uh, wind up being dangerous in some ways. Um, and this kind of links in to the, the, the purpose and audience of uh, digital visualizations in whatever form they take. Uh, for example, Hempsa shows the process of translation from archaeological recovery of building materials to uh, the, the digital translation uh, itself through the process of academic interpretation. Dimensions in Testimony it communicates the lived experience of a Holocaust and concentration camp uh, as a means of giving agency to the survivors and creating a long-lasting digital document um, as, as a reminder of, of humanity's worst. Uh, but if we compare that to the, the Gothenburg case study, the, there's, a, there's a bit of a problem in a way, in the sense that it's located in so many spaces with so many different audiences that it's hard for it to be effective. Um, in the museum, in, in, in the Birth of Gothenburg exhibition, you provided with the rhetoric and the, set, and the history and the context that allows you to read the semiotics, uh, the different signs within the model, of which there is a wealth, um, allowing you to kind of understand the messages that you're receiving from the visual uh, architecture. But in the Tourist Information Office, where it's principally uh, aimed at presumably non-Gothenburgers, perhaps not even Swedes. Um, how are they to grasp the same meanings from the same material without the context surrounding it? And I think this goes to speak of the idea that digitality is not a one-size-fits-all solution. And it's important to remember that it's an ontology as well as a tool. So what works for a Jotoboy, era? Right? it's not going to translate that directly to a tourist experience. Um, without that kind of predefined, pre-existing relationship to the city space. Um, and I think that last point, that, that these aren't universal tools, and they're not a one-size-fits-all solution, I think is probably a good point to finish on. Um, so with that, I would like to say thank you for listening, and thank you to Nina for inviting me. Tack så jättemycket, William. Jag är så glad att vi lyckades övertala dig att delta. Fina perspektiv och 
det, ställ, det ger många frågor. Vi har en fråga från chatten som är lite inne på, på det jag själv kom att tänka på. Historisk miljö och tid känns och levs av levande individer. Det är en väldigt spännande tanke och det är en grund tror jag för mycket där vi gör. Men hur vill du koppla det till frågor om upplevelse av identitet hos individer som meningsskapande? Um, I mean, I think it depends on, 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 on the individual themselves. I mean, for me, as, as, as an Englishman, moving to Gothenburg and... Uh, going through the the birth of Gothenburg exhibition, which coupled to the the, the digital um, uh, experience, that that exhibition is very much aimed at uh, people with that kind of history. It's it's drawn on um, school children's experiences, uh, similarly to how 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 the evaluation and the survey went out to to children in. Uh, the Mexico's Minnen uh, exhibition, and and it was the feedback from from children of a migrant background that fed that that uh, that exhibition. So it draws on the idea of people fleeing Lerda, sir, into the new city of Gothenburg. Uh, and while I don't have that personal experience of of fleeing war, I do have the experience of being uprooted. Uh, and being new in a place and having a, a kind of narrative and, and a, a background of the space itself that I now inhabit, I think it, it, it was very important to me individually. Um, now that's not necessarily going to work for every digital exhibition. Um, but generally, I think that audiences are there. It's just a case of focusing on what it is you want to communicate uh in this case it was the migration aspect um but in, in other museums it's going to be different um and for example vrock most people can't just go and take a set of aqualungs and jump into the sea and go and explore wrecks on the seabed so i mean that's that's the kind of point of communication there it's 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 individual to the museum and, and the audience itself i think so hopefully that answers the question to some <laughs> extent. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we have more questions in the chat. Uh, I think maybe you will answer them by yourself later on. I'm going to hand over the mic to Adam mm -hmm. to close up and mm -hmm. I move in here. So, thank you so much, William. Uh, I have some questions as well, but you are staying here for lunch, perhaps, so we can maybe take that afterwards. Yep. Uh, great presentation, really interesting to see how you, you work from the definition of heritage down to the, the everyday work at her, heritage institutions. So, a great thank you, and uh, I hope that we can get more from the chat and from you later on. Okay. Thank you, thank you and Thank you're very you very so welcome. Much. Thank you. <laughs>